Now we're going to take a look at 50 years of political art starting in 1900. And uh, I'll explain a few terms. And one is, uh, what, what is data? And data was, uh, uh, is, uh, took place uh, basically between 1915 and 1923. And it was a reaction against the prevailing pro-war culture in Germany and the world for that matter. And so this was, uh, data was a word taken out of, I ran it out of the dictionary in the <laughs> and uh, And so it had very much uh, a reaction as well against traditional art, which was all tied up in the idea of pro-war culture. So we're going to first see a slide, but we're going to, oh, also I'm just going to quickly read a quote from one of the great dadists, George Gross. Uh, in those days, after the First World War, we were all dadists. If the word meant anything at all, it meant seething discontent, dissatisfaction, and cynicism. We held dadists meetings, charged a few marks of mission, and did nothing but tell people the truth. That is, abuse them. <laughs> the news spread quickly, and soon our meetings were sold out, crammed with people wanting to be scandalized or just to have fun. So that kind of sums up a good deal of what data was about there. And so it was actually very political, and uh, and surrealism started in the early 20s, and that was a, again a reaction to what was considered rationalism, which was considered to be responsible for starting the First World War. And so <coughs> surrealists thought the unconscious mind was more appropriate to creating art, so they used the unconscious mind to uh, create art that they thought was more true and honest than rationalistly uh, rationalist art, and. Uh, do you want to move the slide along? Is it there too long? No, I think that's, it's okay a little bit. Um, um, so, and surrealists would use uh, methods such uh, as automatic, what they call automatic writing and drawing and painting. And they considered the process of making art to be, in fact, more important than the, the final product, the artifact that was produced from their work. My last comment was in the script. I just wanted to that's <laughs> that. Um, so, and finally, social surrealism. My last comment is also. So, social surrealism was something that the Soviet Union uh, brought in as a had formally in 1934, and they issued said the socialist realism should be worked at is understandable to the workers, and it should portray the workers realistically and it should uh, be served the purposes and aims of the state. So we can see that that's very different from the, uh, what data is and that surrealism is trying to do. So here's our, we're gonna start in 1900, and I put this here just to show you the kind of, um, what was happening in 1900, in 1900. And you can see it's a French socialist poster, and the lettering and the art is very reminiscent of the 19th century, I would say and the post overall poster design. Uh, and the woman represents is a personification of freedom, and she's broken her chains, the chains of the people, and she's leading them on a charge against the Basilica in Paris. And I'm going to try to stop occasionally so you can just look at the images and see whether, you know, they resonate to you and for future ideas of what, how can we use the past art to uh, forge forward in making new kind of political art. And how can we learn from these these pieces? Are there any women in that image? I can't see any from here. Uh, it's there's three, uh, three, three men, and the, the woman is really huge. So, And this is my favorite poster. Uh, and, it's a, and you can see it's a jump four years later. We're really in the 20th century here with this piece. Your favorite poster ever, or well, at this in this series here, <laughs> yeah. Um, and it's one you won't find in any. I've never found in a poster book. Uh, it seems to be lost in history. Where did you find it? I found it in a uh, biography of a book of a Big Bill Haywood. Now that's what's unique about this poster. It's the only poster I know that a union leader designed, and uh, he. Uh, it was a. a, a, a a troubling strike that was going on where basically Colorado was under martial law and uh, workers were uh, arrested, tortured, they were uh, rounded up into bullpens, kept like animals, uh, no lawyers, the court
courts wouldn't intervene. The federal government ignored what was going on in Colorado. So Bill, Big Bill Hayward came up with this brilliant idea. Is Colorado an American? And is there a better symbol for class war here? And uh, he doesn't use people. Look at that. It's just the symbol of America in the flag. The flag isn't static. It's moving. And uh, there's also only 42 states. Yeah. Well, there you go. So that's mm -hmm. at the time. But um, the other thing is that he was later charged with that. It became the most famous poster in America at the time. Mm -hmm. He was later charged with defamation of the flag for making this. And he, he won the case by showing that the flag was used on uh, to sell soup, cigars. <laughs> and uh, it was even on the business card of the hated patent and detective agency. <laughs> it was the notorious strike breakers. And, and uh, so he won that case. And uh, we can see that this kind of image was later used in the 50s, 60s by Jasper Johns. He used to do a lot of paintings like this. And I think Andy Warhol even adopted this in some pieces. And I think even some of it is much like Jenny Holzer's work in the 70s and 80s, uh, just using a line of text. Uh, and, and that's all, you know, a subversive line of text. So I think design-wise, there's a lot going on here that resonates for the rest of the century. Were there any other posters in that book that were connected? No, no, that was it. So he did, uh, Big Bill Hayward did design a few other posters, um, but they, they, I don't have copies of them. So here's a sticker by the Industrial Workers of the World. And it's a rather crude drawing, but it's very effective. There's a sense of movement of the, the, the half-naked man is kind of charging out of the image, breaking the frame. And it's very direct. And the use of stickers was innovative at the time in getting uh, messages from the union out, because uh, workers could just sticker them everywhere. And it was an easy thing to do. It would later be on the cover of the first uh, Little Red Songbook, which was uh, first created in Spokane, Washington, and is still in print today. And of course, songs like Solidarity Forever were first printed in the Little Red Songbook and uh, became obviously anthems of the labor movement. But uh, we don't know who did this piece, but it's, it's very effective as a, as a graphic that's still used today, in fact. And here we have another half naked man. Now we see a, <laughs> a shift in how. We started with a woman charging, but now we're down into half naked men. So I think this uh, represents a shift in how working class people were now being depicted as virile and uh, attractive individuals who were heading forth into a new world of socialism. This is a, a German socialist uh, for a German socialist magazine. And you can see he's sailing a ship where the logo of the mag socialist magazine is, the, is on the map. So he's, this is the, what this is meant by this, is he's sailing into the future a vision of socialism, which is a freedom and, and, and dignity, and, uh, and uh, you know, it's done by a woman as well, 1912. And this would be uh, somewhat, somewhat of a forerunner to socialist realism, but not quite in the, in, the, uh, in the way that the Soviet Union would do it. I'm sure you wish that I had something to say about that. No, I think <laughs> <laughs> But you may jump in at any point. Okay, this is another one of my favorite ones. This is the cover of the Masses, a mag uh, radical magazine out of New York from, that ran from 1911 to 1917. And what's remarkable about it is it's, um, at the time, generally attractive women were used to sell magazines uh, and on posters they were used, whether it was a left-wing or right-wing kind of publication. And that was the norm at the time. So to actually have two working-class women on a cover of a magazine was quite subversive. And we have the two women and one says to the other, gee, Mag, think of us being on a magazine cover. And, and this is almost surrealist in the sense of two women commenting on themselves on a magazine cover. So it's quite remarkable. It almost lead towards postmodernism. Yeah, yeah. So I find it, uh, it quite an extraordinary piece. So. And the magazine was forced out of business because the war, First World War came, and because they were anti-war, they were uh, forced to, uh, the post office wouldn't deliver the mail because it was considered seditious. So that, basically, the magazine's life line of money was cut off from subscriptions, so they had to fool. And here we have a German uh, poster for International Women's Day, but also uh, promoting uh, women's suffrage. And this is a very bold image. You can see she's waving a flag, but it's not a flag of nationalism. It's a flag of ideology. And 
I remember in the 70s and seeing this poster being used on uh, water for water to dance. That's how I should travel as, as a bold image, it seems. What is Frau and Volga? Well, that the book, well, it's, it's both women the book, you know, it means women. Well, women's get out, or, you know, bring it out. Well, bring let's, it out, bring it on. I thought it might go away. Well, it's okay. calling for women's suffrage, okay. so, however, mm -hmm. you know, you look at it, but, uh, and also note that the date is uh, March 1914, mm -hmm. and the war, war would start only a few months later in August, mm -hmm. the first one was, so. <laughs> and here we have a data uh, artist, Hanhoch, a German, and this is, again, a reaction to the First World War. This is in 1919, and she uh, created this piece as a way to mock those politicians and military people who started the First World War and carried it on and uh, survived it to have careers in the Weimar Republic at the time. So she's, uh, you know, it's also to indicate the uh, horror of war, the craziness, the insanity of war by cutting up bits and pieces and shoving them all together onto this, into this montage. She was one of the co-creators of photo montage along with John Hartfield and a few other people. So it's, it's again, quite a remarkable piece because uh, it really challenges the notion of, of what is art at that time to uh, create a montage. This was really on the edge of this. This, this is revolutionary. Was this, did, were there pre precursors to this in terms of montage that you found? Not, well, yeah, there were, there was a lot of people doing it around that time, starting in, in a few years prior to it, but it really kind of climaxed in 1919 after the war. Was the start political or was the start just? Always oh, political, yeah. The montage was always political. The, a lot of them were, yes, yes, most of them were. That Because data was definitely a political right. movement. And here we have another montage, <laughs> which in, incorporates a drawing as well, and uh, it's by George Gross, the dadist, and uh, who would later be the most famous satirist in Europe at the time in the 20s. And so this is a, one of the first pieces to create uh, a connection between capitalism and the military. And so we have the, the capitalist is obviously the figure in the center, he's got the suit and everything, and in his heart is the military. So this is a visual representation of that relationship, and behind it is all the media that fans the flames of war and uh, promotes war. And so this was a theme that George Gross would go back again and again in the 1920s to attack that kind of relationship. Okay, and here we have um, an avant-garde piece for Russia. And uh, now, this is clearly not socialist realism, and this would be a time that was a great deal of freedom in Russia to uh, design and be creative. And so this is one of the remarkable periods. Uh, completely non-representational, no human figures, of course. Uh, and, it was, and, and the message is simple, it's the red wedge to uh, victory of the Red Wedge uh, the, of the Bolshevik army over the White Army. And so the thing is, it's, uh, and I'll, I should read just briefly what he said about it himself, the artist. The artist constructs a new symbol with his brush. This symbol is not a recognizable form of anything that is already finished, already made, or already existed in the world. It is a symbol of a new world, which is being built upon and which exists by way of the people. Now, the form of it is very, is great, it's very abstract, but in fact the meaning of it is, seems to me simple because it's just victory over your enemy. It doesn't seem like it's really, to me, community, communicating a new world, but he feels differently. Were the, were the words in Cyrillic, were they significant? Did, did, uh, did well, victory, victory over the, the Red Army, the Red Wedge, you know, it's the title. The title is actually yeah, the word. Essentially, yes. Okay, this is by uh, Kat Paul, the German artist who normally does these very uh, detailed, realistic drawings in pencil and charcoal. And a lot of them are quite somber and, and somewhat depressing, but I, I like this poster a lot because it, it feels really raw, that drawing feels really rough and almost bizarrely unreal. And it looks like it was done on, in a hurry, which is a good quality because it's about, you know, war should end completely. And so there's a certain urgency to it, which is really quite powerful. And again, the poster has stood up to time, and we've seen it over the decades being used again and again under certain circumstances. So in that way, it's quite, um, it's very punk almost in a sense of, of this presentation and urgency. And here we, uh, we, we're at 1926 now. This is a Russian poster 
uh, uh, equating uh, the emancipation of women with uh, socialism. And it is in many ways a kind of a forerunner of socialist realism. Yet if you look at it, it, it doesn't quite conform because the figure looks sort of like a robot. And the fingers are somewhat robotic. And even look at the flag, compare that with what we saw earlier, the flowing red flag. And this one looks, it, it's all, you know, you can fold it up. It just feels completely unreal. Where is this in relation to Cubism? Kind of well, Cubism started much earlier. I think Picasso was doing Cubism in 1910, was he sort of, or, or around this time. But I think it's influenced by that. But, but a little bit of everything, you would see this, again, it was still relatively free. You were still relatively free to create and design how you wanted to at that time. But uh, the, and the idea of emancipation, which was really by the, the uh, factories in the backgrounds that women can now work side by side with men in a factory. So that was emancipation. This is, a, this is another favorite of mine. It's by the great John Hartford, the German uh, co-inventor of photomontage. And this is an election poster. And you'll note that there's no candidate and there's no party logo. That's how revolutionary this poster is. And uh, essentially what it's saying is you, is you have five fingers to grab the enemy and five fingers to, to vote with and you will be voting column five, which is where the Communist Party on the electoral list was situated. So it's drawing all the things in with five and the five fingers. So it's actually quite uh, a very bold uh, design that you, you, you with the hard press you can find somebody attempting that today. That's how so would, would it be universal that people would know that column five was the Communist Party? Well, in every, uh, in every election, they would be on a different column. Okay. So it depends on whether it's a state election or federal election. In this case, it, it is it is. So it people wouldn't know in advance that it was going to be in, so they're well that no, it's not necessarily that's why they're telling you. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. So they're telling you to, you know, in case you're yeah. not paying attention, it's qualified. So yeah. and here's a poster, a Russian poster, a uh, film poster that um, is uh, for a film commemorating the first eleven years of Bolshevik rule in Russia. And what's interesting about it is that they try to be inclusive here. You have a mother son, you have a sailor, you have a, a worker, and you have um, a, a black guy in there. And can you imagine in 1928 a poster like this in America? In, in America, the, the, the plan is a peak of six million members in America. Can you imagine an inclusive poster like this? So, and that, that's why I included it here, because I think it's quite remarkable. And also, it's, it's a really somewhat abstract kind of design. It's very modern looking. And it still stands up today. What film was it uh, advertising? It was a film called The Eleventh, and uh, meaning the eleventh anniversary of the Bolshevik Revolution. Um, and it was uh, by Vertov, which is a very famous guy who did the he did the movie. Yeah. Yeah. So, so here's a, a mural by Diego Rivera about the state of the world we're into the 1930s. And it was a mural that he originally had, had Nelson Rockefeller had attempted, had asked him to create in New York. And he did go there and he created it. And then when he put Lenin in the, in the uh, image, uh, Rockefeller had the, the mural destroyed. So uh, Rivera went back to Mexico City and he had re recreated it there. And so it's a rather, the, the workers at the center, but he seems to be controlling the world. Like he almost looks like he's using a computer or he's using a spaceship. But, but the, the, the thing about it is that essentially it's saying that the way to the future, a better world, is follow that Lenin is leading the, the workers on the side. So even though Lenin had been dead for 12 years or something. So um, that's how he wanted to present the current state of the world. And obviously we can read into it many things, but it's a, and it's massive. So here we have Picasso's famous piece where um, he created it to uh, commemorate the um, uh, bombing in the uh, in, in Spain by the fascists, and, and uh, the work went on to travel around Europe to raise money and awareness for the Republican cause in the Spanish Civil War. And I don't know if many paintings have done that, but it was remarkable because it was so huge to transport it. But that that was what happened. They had to cut it out of the frame every time. And uh, and and the thing is, it clearly is not socialist realism. And at the time, Picasso. Uh, was criticized by you know members of the left and uh, as uh, this is and, and members and right wing left wing people really didn't like this as a 
an aesthetic. They thought it could have been done by a four-year-old. That was sad at the time. And so he, he, it was not internationally loved the way it seems to be now when it was set down. And that's the nature of art. Did, did Picasso do the touring of it? Did somebody else do it? No, somebody it? else. Yeah. Was, wasn't it done for the World's Fair? Yeah, it was initially done for a pavilion, Spanish pavilion. That's where it first was. But then after that, it was taken down and shipped off in, in, uh, by a system of delivering Now, here's another, here's Miro, who was, doing, who was a surrealist. And this is another piece uh, in aid of the, the Republican cause of the Spanish Civil War. And it was a poster he made to raise money for, for the Republican side. And uh, there's a traditional, he's got the fist raised. I think it's supposed to be a farmer, but I'm, I'm not completely sure on that. But uh, it's quite uh, beautiful in its, its old use of color. Mm -hmm. <coughs> is it a stamp or? No, it's a, think, like a print, I think. But I think it, it also was a stamp. Yeah. Yeah, well, oh, yes, it was a stamp. Yeah. Yes, you're both right. Yes. 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 What just happened No, you're. <laughs> but I wasn't going to be correct until she said it. No, no. I <laughs> wasn't going to be denied by correctness until I got a witness. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot about the stamp. Yes. 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 So here's another piece by Picasso. We're now into 1940s, 1949. And this is the first time we see this image of the, the dove uh, on a peace poster. And Picasso was now a member of the Communist Party. And uh, they came around to his studio and he had some drawings and stuff. And they looked and they, they said, well, what about, let's use this dove for a dove of peace. And he said, well, it's not a dove, it's a pigeon. So everybody has, thinks this is, a, this is a pigeon. He never changed the drawing. So he said, well, you know, those people think it's a dove. So. <laughs> um, so he was so, that's, again, that's the nature of art, how we don't know how it all... It's, it's really one of the themes of your book, too, is yeah. that uh, we don't know how art will be interpreted by the audience, and, yes. and you really can't control that. Yes, yeah, so that's... Uh, and he would obviously use the motif of the dove uh, many times in other posters. And so finally, we've come 50 years, this is 1954, and this is going to end in a kind of a depressing way, because. You know, we started out with uh, looking for a better world, uh, the rise of unionism and, and workers' rights and, and feminism, and, and what have we come to, and then the end of war, and what have we come to, we come to, please don't kill us. It, 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 it's because of nuclear war, we, the left has now gone into a defensive mode. We're, we're not asking for a better world, we're asking to just save this one. So we would see, um, we have to wait another dozen or so years until the uh, latter parts of the 60s before we would start to see a new kind of cultural uh, vision for the future. And of course at this time, the rise of the um, civil rights movement was occurring, of course. Um, so there were other things going on, but at this point the left seemed to go into a malaise and also for the, because of the red, red, uh, red baiting, red scare, and, and McCarthyism seemed to destroy a lot of the sense of a vision of a new world. <laughs>